I think I figured out the meaning behind Zoro's left eye and I want to talk about it. Ever since the time skip when Zoro reappeared with the scar over his left eye, this scar and his eye has been the source of many discussions and speculations. Does it hold some sort of special power or ability? You know, is he hiding some sort of Sharingan eye? Or is it simply a design choice? Well, I think I've uncovered a new layer of meaning behind this scar and it's all thanks to Norse mythology. If you've been following my channel, you'll know that I have recently been really into Norse mythology and I've dedicated an entire video discussing the many connections, the many, many connections that seem to exist between Norse folklore and One Piece. Because in my opinion, not only will Nordic mythology be important to Elbaf, but I think it could tell us a whole lot more about the entire series of One Piece itself. So I do highly recommend you go watch that video if you haven't already. But as I teased in that discussion, there is one folktale or one element within Norse mythology that I didn't discuss in that video because I think it deserves its own discussion. And that is the Norse connection that may relate to our trusty straw hat swordsman, Mr. Roronoa Zoro and the mystery of his left eye. So we're going to discuss that today. But before we do, please make sure to subscribe to the channel. Zoro's left eye isn't the only mystery we're going to figure out today. Today, we're also going to figure out why over 50% of you aren't subscribed to this channel. And if you are one of those who are not subscribed, then please do to help me get to 100k subscribers. That way we can finally get on with discussing Zoro. But before we actually get on with that, I also want to say a big thank you to Phil Mora, who is the sponsor of today's video. I love discussing One Piece, but making these videos isn't easy work. Which is why, aside from you subscribing, I'm also super excited about the super intuitive cross-platform video editing software Filmora. Filmora has loads of built-in features and assets, meaning you can achieve so much. For example, look at this sword background that fits my topic of Zoro perfectly. There's also tons of AI features to make Filmora work for you. You can use AI copywriting to generate compelling descriptions, titles, and captions on your behalf. Or how about speech to text so that your video has automatic captions? Filmora Filmora is available on Windows, Mac, iOS, and Android, so you really have no excuse not to use it. So make sure to use the link below to download Filmora now. I'll also be giving to three lucky people licenses to Wondershare Filmora, so make sure you comment below your experiences with the video making software for your chance to win your ticket to a smoother video making experience. Making your own video has never been easier. Thanks Filmora! Okay, so let's get back to Zoro's eye. Like I said, there have been lots of discussions, lots of theories centering around this topic, and there have been for many, many years. While some fans have claimed that this is just a design choice, I think it is fair to assume that there is a greater significance, a greater meaning, or at least the story behind what happened to result in Zoro's scar. On the other hand, take a look at these concept designs that were published at the end of chapter 597, because looking at this, it seems like Oda may have always envisioned for Zoro to sport some sort of scar on his face following the time skip, but this scar wasn't necessarily always going to be over his eye, and it wasn't always going to be on the left side of his face either. In which case, looking at these concepts, you sort of do question whether this really was just simply a design choice, and Oda just liked the idea of Zoro sporting some sort of scar on his face. I guess it could just be a simple mark that emphasizes what sort of grueling, heavy training that Zoro underwent during the time skip with Mihawk. But even if that was the original intention, even if Oda just simply liked the idea of symbolizing the time skip and that growth through a mark, I'm sure as Oda settled on the design, and I'm sure as he settled on the stories that he would devise for each of the Straw Hats, I think he would have also developed a more important story about how Zoro actually attained that scar over his left eye. Especially because we know that scar scars often have a deeper significance in One Piece. This is something we've seen through very important characters throughout the entirety of the series. And for starters, I think the significance of scars in general, or physical disfigurements should I say, that seems to be an important idea that Oda has been greatly inspired by from Norse mythology. Because according to Norse beliefs, scars represent more than just a physical mark of injury. Or more so than scars itself, injuries and specifically missing limbs or missing body parts 
physical disfigurements. This seems to be a very central idea within Norse mythology. Apparently, it represents this notion that individuals had to pay the highest price in order to achieve any unique duty or achievement. And it's said that those with marks of physical disfigurement or almost ritualistic mutilation, these markings seem to be symbols of a special destiny. That's why there's a running theme of significant figures across Norse mythology who each have lost a body part, each for very significant reasons, each disfigurement representing something very important. And this is obviously an idea that is very present in One Piece. We similarly have key characters with unique scars or missing limbs and other sorts of physical disfigurements, each scar or each disfigurement for very specific reasons. That's an idea that was presented to us from the very first chapter of the series with Shanks. So I think it can be said, I think it can be fairly assumed that Oda was very likely influenced by Norse tradition in implementing this within his series. And I think this may also apply in the case of Zoro's left eye. And the figure that I want to focus on, the one that I think has the clearest connection, will make the most sense in trying to understand the mystery of Zoro's left eye, that is none other than the all-father of Norse mythology himself, the Azir god Odin. So for those of you who don't know, Odin is the chief of the Azir pantheon. That means he's the chief or the head of the Azir gods. The Azir gods being the main group of gods that exist in Norse mythology. So you can almost think of him as being like Zeus in Greek mythology. Odin was the god of war. And over time, he also became associated with nobility and royalty. But Odin was also regarded as a god of of knowledge. Many tales about Odin center around him going on different quests to acquire knowledge, most of these also involving him sacrificing himself to attain this sort of wisdom. In fact, one of the passages I came across whilst researching Odin was the following. Sitting on his throne, Hilshkaf, with Frigga in the Hall of Valhalla, Odin looked out across the whole world, but he wanted to know everything and gain wisdom and knowledge of things hidden from him. This was a desire that drove him to sacrifice himself. Please excuse my terrible pronunciation there. But based on this passage, it seems to suggest that Odin already had the ability to see into all of the realms. But this wasn't enough for him. He wanted more. Not only did he want to be able to see into all the world, he wanted the knowledge and wisdom of all of the realms. And I think even from this statement, we can already make a connection to Zoro. The idea that Odin already had this great ability to see into all the realms, but this still wasn't enough to satisfy for him. I think that could be very much like how Zoro, despite being a fantastic, despite being a very skilled swordsman, that's not enough for him. It's not enough until he becomes the best. It's not enough until he becomes the world's strongest. Kind of like how Odin wants all of the world's knowledge. And if we keep going, it's said that this leads Odin to undertake crazy actions. For example, Odin hangs himself on Yggdrasil for nine days and nine nights, starving without food or water, all in order to gain the knowledge of the other worlds, as well as the knowledge to be able to understand the runes. Runes referring to the writing script. And I don't know about you, but for me, this sort of almost symbolic ritualistic suicide, this paints a very familiar image to the one that we were presented with upon our first introduction to Zoro in the series. Despite being hailed as this great and fearsome pirate hunter, when we first meet him at Shellstown, Zoro is tied up to a pole in the town square, starving with no food or drink. And then most relevant to today's topic about Zoro's missing eye, it's well known that Odin sacrificed his eye at the well of Mimir in the pursuit of knowledge. The well of Mimir, or Mimi's brother, as per its traditional name, and again, my apologies for butchering the pronunciation, this well is said to be beneath one of the roots, one of the three roots of Yggdrasil, the world tree which contains much wisdom. And Mimir is actually also one of the Azir gods, and this god Mimir is known to be the wisest god. And so, Odin sought Mimir's knowledge and wisdom, but it's said that when Odin asked Mimir for a drink, Mimir, understanding the value of this 
bring water, he refused Odin, and he wouldn't offer Odin a drink unless Odin sacrificed or offered an eye in return. And that's exactly what Odin did. He took out his own left eye and he left it in Mimir's well, all so that he could just have a drink from this well of wisdom. And this folktale has been largely interpreted to mean that for those like Odin who share in his value for knowledge and for learning, there is no sacrifice that's too large when it comes to attaining this sort of great wisdom. Now, what sort of wisdom or knowledge Odin exactly acquired isn't known to us, but it's commonly understood that it has something to do with perception, especially given the symbolic meaning of giving up an eye as a sacrifice, where throughout various cultures, throughout time, this idea of the eye or seeing or vision, these are all ways to talk about perception and understanding. So it seems that in this case, Odin has traded one mode of perception for another. And this also seems to specifically relate to the figure of Mimir as well, because Mimir's name can actually be translated to the remembrance or memory. And so in this way, Mimir is apparently the being that taught the other gods to live in accordance with ancient traditions. Mimir seems to be the representation of ancient knowledge, ancient wisdom, this idea of a remembrance or memory of ancient traditions. And so I think that has been interpreted to mean that Odin traded a superficial mode of perception, or in other words, his eyes being a superficial everyday mode of perception, in order to gain a more sacred mode of perception, one that imbues him with this deep ancestral wisdom and knowledge. And I think this can also be very easily applied to Zoro. When it comes to the recurring theme of sacrifice that's present in Odin, in my opinion, I think this idea is already very much ingrained in Zoro's character. I think we've seen it time and time again. For example, if we go back to his introduction to the series, I think we can interpret those actions in him choosing to hang and starve as sort of a sacrifice for the sake of Rika. We've seen that he's more than willing to sacrifice his own life and he's willing to sacrifice his dream for the sake of his Captain Luffy. We saw that at the end of Thriller Bark. Even when he asks Mihawk to teach him during the time skip, Mihawk comments that Zoro has sacrificed his pride for the sake of Luffy. And then even on a more superficial level, the intense, the incredibly intense, his memeable training regime, the grueling training that he puts himself through on a very regular basis, I think even that can be seen as a physical sacrifice, one that he endures all for the purpose of getting stronger, all for the purpose of becoming the best. So then when it comes to the mystery of his left eye, I think we're very likely to see a scenario where Zoro made a great sacrifice where he sacrificed his eye in order to become a greater, stronger fighter. If Oda decides to stick closer to Norse mythology, we may even see that Zoro traded his eye, again his common mode of perception, to attain a greater sense of perception. And now I don't necessarily mean he had to literally trade his eye in a similar way way that Odin did, but I guess a sacrifice, a more symbolic gesture to gain a greater sense of perception. If we think more along the lines of literal combat terms, perception could mean depth perception, for example. You know, Zoro may have a greater understanding of distances, gauging distances during his battles. But if we think in more abstract terms, and I guess a little bit closer to the situation with Odin and Mimir, Zoro could have just gained a more divine and deeper sense of perception, maybe a divine, deeper understanding of swords and swordsmanship, or a deeper understanding of the ancient tradition of the sword. Especially because if you look at certain translations of chapter 597, Zoro asks Mihawk to teach him the way of the sword. Now admittedly, this isn't actually the line or the dialogue that the official Viz translation adopts. Here, according to Viz, Zoro just asks Mihawk to teach him what you know. No, but this is a case where I think I actually like the other translation better. It has greater gravitas and I think it says more about this idea of swordsmanship, of a swordsman code, the way of the sword. Especially because the way of the sword has been something that Zoro has said on multiple occasions aside from here. And if we're linking it back to our topic today, it fits better with that idea of a perception, a deeper, more divine, an understanding 
of the ancient tradition of swordsmanship. You know, we may see a scenario where Mihawk made a comment to Zoro that Zoro relies too much on what he can see and instead he needs to be able to perceive. He needs to be able to perceive and feel and understand his surroundings. And I guess this would actually be sort of a similar learning or similar lesson that Zoro learned himself during his fight against Mr. One in the Arabasta arc. During that battle, we saw Zoro learn how to hear the breath of all things and that was instrumental in Zoro defeating Dust Bones. And I don't really want to get into the discussion of whether that was Zoro's early manifestation of Haki or not because I think for the purposes of today's discussion, what is important is that Zoro has already experienced swordsmanship requires a deeper, greater perception, a greater understanding, regardless of whether that's owed to Haki or not. And just as a sidebar, it's kind of funny to think about perception when it comes to Zoro because if that was the case, if he has truly gained better perception, clearly hasn't improved his sense of perception when it comes to location or places, still terrible at navigation. But anyways, it is also worth noting that in chapter 779, which is really the only scene we have of Zoro's training under Mihawk, Zoro actually still has his left eye unharmed. We can see his full eye, there's no scar, and of course we don't know at what stage during the two year time skip this was occurring, but in this moment Mihawk was teaching Zoro to imbue his swords with Haki, with armament Haki, and so it's possible that Zoro may have just lost his eye while trying to learn how to achieve this feat. And some have argued that since this is really the only definitive or concrete knowledge that we've seen Zoro actually learn from Mihawk, imbuing Haki into his sword is the way of the sword that Zoro was referring to. And I've also seen that people are quite upset about Haki, how Haki seems to be the answer to Zoro's swordsmanship. And again, I think that's a whole other discussion, not really the focus of today's video, but I do want to say that I beg to differ. I don't think that imbuing Haki is all that Zoro has learnt. I think Odo is just saving a greater look into Zoro's training under Mihawk, for that final duel with Mihawk. And that's where we're going to see a lot more of the training come out. A lot more flashbacks to show that Zoro is now implementing things that he learned. But I think that for the purposes of today's discussion, if people are already upset about Zoro's big level up being Haki, and that being the great way of the sword that he learned during the time skip, I think by that same logic, Zoro having some sort of almost supernatural ability like a Sharingan eye, that also shouldn't or can't be the answer. Especially if we go back to those early concept designs. It seems like Zoro could have ended up with a scar on any part of his head and Oda wasn't necessarily or he wasn't originally focusing on Zoro's eye. And so I'm going to take that to mean that it's less likely that Zoro's eye is closed because he's secretly housing some special ability. Also because since the time skip we have seen or there have been opponents against whom Zoro has really struggled or at least there has been King the Lunarian being the main one that Zoro has really struggled with. And if Zoro had a trick up his sleeve like a crazy eye power, I feel like Wano was the time that he should have broken it out. You know, those were some pretty dire times. He was really struggling against King. Now, obviously, this isn't all to say that it's impossible that Zoro is hiding some sort of secret ability. This is one piece at the end of the day. You can never say never. And look, I think it would even be pretty fun to see him have some sort of crazy Sharingan ability, you know, in a this is wild, this is crazy, unbelievable kind of way. But I have to say that personally for me, I prefer something a little more grounded. I prefer the idea that Zoro traded his left eye or that he sacrificed his eye. He sacrificed his common mode of perception, all for the sake of gaining a greater sense of perception, all for the sake of gaining something that will make him a truer, better swordsman, a better, stronger swordsman who truly understands the way of the sword. As always, with historical or mythological, any sort of real-life inspirations, I don't think Oda has taken Odin's character one for one, but there are some other similarities between Odin and Zoro that I think you may be interested in. Apparently, Odin is also often portrayed as a charming man who enjoys drinking mead and wine, and I found that quite fun because obviously that's a clear likeness to Zoro who also has shown 
shown his love for drinking on many occasions. And we also know that Zoro is also charming in his own way. You know, from the beginning of the series, we've seen that he is able to amass his own followers. Odin was also known as the Wanderer, often depicted as traveling, whether that be on his quests to gain knowledge or whether that be to oversee events that's occurring throughout the world. And when Odin is described on his travels, often readers aren't explicitly told that this is Odin. It seems that the tales just speak of an old man with only one eye, wearing a coat or a cloak, and wearing a wide-brimmed hat, carrying a spear. And we're just supposed to be able to tell from this description that this is Odin. And I thought it was interesting to find out about Odin's association with a wide-brimmed hat. Obviously because this seems to be more like Luffy, who has his own wide-brimmed hat, his own wide-brimmed straw hat. But like I said, these interpretations, these inspirations are never taken taken one for one, and it's possible that maybe given Odin's importance to Norse mythology, again he's the head god, maybe Odin's interest in Norse tales overall meant that he was also inspired by Odin and his wide brimmed hat when creating the straw hat. But if we go back to this image of a man travelling on his lonesome, going about his solo adventures, I think that is a very fitting image for Zoro. We often see Zoro get up to his own solo quests within an arc, we witnessed this very recently at the beginning of Wano, for example, but it's also how I like to imagine Zoro's future self at the end of the series or during the epilogue. I can very much imagine Zoro as an old man wandering about from place to place, being very distinguishable by his one eye as well as the great sword or his great three swords that he carries. It also feels very Rayleigh-esque, which I think is also fitting because Zoro and Rayleigh are the right-hand men of their respective captains. But this image of a wandering one-eyed man, that also led me down another thought train. Given One Piece is a pirate manga, many fans have long been wondering why the series doesn't feature a pirate wearing the classic pirate eye patch. Especially because that eye patch has become almost synonymous with piracy in modern day depictions. And in response, Oda actually said all the way back in 2007 that by the end of the series, there will be a character who does wear the classic eye patch. And actually the translation from Oda says, a pirate with an eye patch will appear in the final phase of One Piece. I'm itching to draw that character as soon as possible. And based on these words, it feels to me that Oda is actually talking about a new character, a new character who's going to make their appearance in the final saga. A pirate whose eye patch is going to be a focal part of his or her design. And given that we now know that Joy Boy was the world's first pirate, and we are now in the final saga, but we haven't actually seen Joy Boy's full appearance yet. I think it would be most fitting to give Joy Boy the eye patch, you know, the OG pirate wearing the pirate's eye patch. But Oda's comment is pretty vague, and so it is possible that he was just saying that there is going to be an eye patch at some point in the series, we're going to see it by the end of the series, and in that case, that could still be Zoro. Especially because if we again go back to the concept designs, it seems like that one of these designs looks almost looks like Zoro is wearing an eye patch, and so I have imagined if we get some sort of epilogue, maybe we could potentially see Zoro become the wandering old man much like Odin, but this is going to be an old Zoro wearing an eye patch, following his terrible sense of direction to just go to all sorts of different places that aren't necessarily where he initially intended to go, and I quite, I rather like this image of Zoro, especially because he started out the series as a pirate hunter. But if he ends up with an eye patch, that means by the end of the series, he's going to be wearing the most iconic piece of clothing or the most iconic piece of attire that has been associated with piracy. But with all said and done, I still do think that Joy Boy is probably the most likely candidate to be wearing the eye patch. Anyways, I just found it really cool to learn about Odin. And as soon as I came across this tale of how he lost his eye, that immediately made me think of Zoro and his left eye. And I was really excited to share this all with you so let me know what you guys think about Zoro and his eye and his scar by leaving a comment below thank you for listening to another one of my ramblings don't forget to subscribe to the channel you can also support the channel further by becoming a patreon or channel member like these wonderful wonderful people but please do subscribe so that you don't miss out on more one piece discussions this is joy girl and i'll see you again soon